But again, we are going to start with that deadly crime spree in Washington County today. It started with a stabbing at the Wells Fargo in Beaverton. And by the time it was all over, a man stabbed four people and one of them was dead. Police finally arrested that suspect here on Southwest 83rd Avenue, just a few blocks from Westside Christian High School. The investigation spans multiple crime sprees, uh, crime scenes rather in Beaverton and Tiger. Do you see on the map? We got an update now from police just about an hour ago. Lindsay Nadrich was at the news conference for us. Lindsay, this appears, if you can believe it, to be a random attack on multiple people. Well, police say this started as a robbery at the Wells Fargo here behind me, so it does appear to be random. They still have a large area of this parking lot blocked off as they continue to investigate. People who were here when it happened told me it was scary and chaotic. In police radio traffic, you can hear the initial call for officers to respond to the Wells Fargo Bank at the Murray Hill Shopping Center in Beaverton. Hill dispatch to an armed robbery incident 809. Shield Boulevard, Murray Shoals at the Wells Fargo. Looks like a machete was used. There was one customer that was in. Police say two women were stabbed inside the Wells Fargo. One of them is in critical condition. The other died. Dylan Prickett says he was at the coffee shop next to the bank when it happened. And I came outside and there was an employee of the bank bawling her eyes out. She couldn't even talk. Um, and then some of the coffee shop employees and customers came outside with me and that's when they wheeled uh, somebody that looked like they had uh, like a stab wound to her neck. She was really bandaged and just there was a lot of blood. After leaving the bank, police say the suspect stole a car from a man outside Planet Fitness in this same shopping center and stabbed him as well. The suspect in the case uh, then drove the car south into Tigard, uh, where he then stole another adult woman's car and stabbed her in the process. Carrie D, who works at this Chevron 10 minutes from the shopping center, says she saw the suspect get out of this truck and take off. Guy pulled up, jumped out of the vehicle and took off going around the uh, gas station here, picked up my cigarettes <laughs> and dropped some money along the way. And then next thing I know, there's like 20 cops going up and down the road, so. And the suspect's on foot behind the Chevron there. The suspect was eventually arrested. A family who lives in this Tigard neighborhood say police searched their backyard and watched as the suspect was taken away in handcuffs. So there was like five or six police cars outside of my house and there was a man on my neighbor's driveway that the police ar arrested and he, they called for uh, an ambulance because he was bleeding. Police say the suspect is a 20 year old man. His name has not yet been released. Dan. Lindsay, I can't stop thinking about the victims and their families. Just unbelievably chaotic. Thank you for the details. We look forward to finding out more about why this all happened. So we can't say at any moment the House is expected to vote on impeaching President Trump. And when that happens, we will bring it to you live right here on KGW. Of course, it's been a very long day in the House of Representatives. It started with the vote on how the debate would happen around 9 o'clock this morning. Representatives from both parties got a chance to speak about impeachment. Now, this outcome will not be a surprise. Democrats are in control of the House. There's little doubt that the president will, in fact, be impeached. Once that happens, President Trump will be the third president in U.S. history to officially be impeached. That means a full-fledged impeachment trial will begin in the Senate. We had our verified team look into that process and how it will differ from what we've seen so far. Here's Jason Puckett. Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution. The House of Representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment. Quote, the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. Simple, right? The House impeaches a president, the Senate holds the trial. Well, no, not that simple. We've had weeks of testimony in House committees. We heard from advisors, former ambassadors, and more. But when it comes to the Senate, the trial itself could look completely different. Take another look. The Constitution says the Senate will hold the trial, that the senators will be on oath, and that it will take two-thirds vote to convict. But it leaves everything else up to the Senate. So big questions like, will there be witnesses? Have to be debated. In President Andrew Johnson's impeachment, 40 witnesses testified in public. In President Clinton's impeachment, after long debate, witnesses were 
question in private and videotaped clips were played to the Senate. So you can see it's different each and every time. Historically, the Senate majority and minority leaders have worked together to develop the rules. Now that's Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer in this case. They both said they want to come up with bipartisan rules like in the past, but it's worth noting the Republicans have enough Senate members to vote through rules without any Democratic support. One last note, the Constitution also says that the Supreme Court Chief Justice will oversee the trial. Now, Chief Roberts in this case, could allow witnesses or rule changes that aren't explicitly written out, but unlike a judge in a courtroom, Justice Roberts can actually be overruled. If a majority votes against his ruling, it's overturned. Bottom line, the Senate holds the power here and they will determine not only the rules for the trial, but how those rules are actually carried out. With your Verify, I'm Jason Puckett. And we are most likely going to watch that play out here in the coming days and weeks. And if you have something that you want to see verified, email us at verifykgw.com. A reminder again, when the impeachment vote happens, we will bring it to you live here on KGW. A Vancouver man is in jail tonight, accused of strangling a transgender teen and dumping her body in a remote area in Clark County. Our Kristen Severance joins us now to explain what police say happened that night. Kristen. Yeah, Dan, 25 year old David Bog Devav was is facing second degree murder charges tonight. He appeared in court briefly earlier today. Police believe he became angry with Nikki Kuhnhausen after she told him she was transgender following a sexual encounter. Police say the 17 year old victim was last seen getting picked up by the 25 year old at a friend's home early in the morning of June 6th after messaging with him on Snapchat. She was reported missing a few days later. A hiker found her remains earlier this month in the Larch Mountain area of Clark County. Her friends were at the courthouse today and they were in tears. She was so bright. Everything was a smile. Oh, Even if she was just coming up to you, she was smiling. She was always happy. She was a good person. She never did no harm to anybody. Now, Bogdanov is being held without bail. The prosecutor's office will determine if he'll also face hate crime charges. Police said today during a news conference that the case remains under investigation, and they said the role of the suspect's two brothers, quote, raises some concerns. So more to come on that, Dan. All right, Kristen, thank you. So a big cleanup today in Salem. This is as police start to enforce a new ban on homeless camping. Now, this new law went into effect on Monday, but the city did give campers a few days notice here. At 9 o'clock this morning, though, the cleanup process, it started, and now the big concern, as you can probably guess for many of these people, is where they're going to go now. What's going on here is everybody is in panic mode. Nobody was ready, obviously. But I'm asking all of you, everybody, how can you let this happen? Granted, there was an eyesore out here and it was terrible. He was a big guy. But that's because these people have been run out of everywhere. There's no place for them to go. How can you stand by and let this city throw them out? So city council approved funding for 140 new shelter beds. The thing is, those beds aren't going to be available not until the new year. So those people have to find something else in between now and then. Most of us use electricity with you know little thought about how it's made, but there is a big change coming to the West and you need to pay attention to it because it will impact each and every one of us. We're talking about it tonight at 630 during a KGW news special called Power Struggle. Now, if you want to watch it right now, use the camera on your smartphone. There's a QR code you just saw pop up at the bottom of your screen. Point it at that, the camera. It'll open it up, the YouTube page, take you right to it, and uh, help you see this story now. Uh, Pat Doris joins us right now. He spent the past few weeks putting all of this together. And I think the big question is, what are we going to feel, the normal, everyday person, when it comes to this change? Well, the biggest thing could be five or six years out, but it could also be rolling blackouts, which is something that I've never experienced. I've been here for 30 years. Yeah. A lot of people that have lived here a lot longer say, it just hasn't happened. There's a chance that we're going to feel it through that because there may not be enough power to meet demand. It's a big part of what we're going to focus on tonight at 630. Here's a little bit of our special report. Environmental advocates began the push to kill coal in the West a decade ago and say it's critically important to finish the job now. You support getting rid of these coal plants? Absolutely support the closure of the coal plants on a schedule and with a plan that maintains the reliability of the system. That future reliability is something you should care about very much. If the electric system is reliable, the lights go on every time you hit the switch. But if it's not reliable, sometimes you get no power. Coal may be dirty, 
but it is reliable. It works when you need it, every time. But over the next eight years, 12 coal plants across the West will shut down. They range from Centralia, Washington, to southeastern Montana, north-central Nevada, to Wyoming, and Boardman, Oregon. Combined, they generate a huge amount of electricity, 4,800 megawatts. That's enough power to turn on the lights for 3.8 million homes. So that's kind of a big deal. You can watch the half-hour special right here at 6.30 tonight. If you can't watch it, you can also see it on our YouTube channel, as Dan mentioned. You've got the QR code there. It's a really important issue. We're going to stay on this as it develops. We'll see you at 6.30. All right, Pat, we will see you then.